Hello again, this is segment two of the unit one lecture introduction to commodities marketing. Let's resume our discussion here on grain merchandising. So we'll jump in and talk really quick futures and basis. And again, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about futures and basis and how to calculate these throughout the semester. Um, but let's just give you a quick overview here. Futures price by definition is the value of grain at a neutral delivery point. Um, we know that grain is traded actively in, on the Chicago Board of Trade. It's, understand, it's important to point out that there are no grain elevators. There's no place to dump grain at the Chicago Board of Trade in downtown Chicago, uh, nor any of the other trading sites uh, like the Kansas City Board of Trade, which tr is the main wheat trading site. There's no grain elevator there. So we're talking in terms of futures price is the value of that grain at any certain neutral delivery point. And it's based upon futures transactions of buyers and sellers across the country. It's somewhat speculation, of course. Cash grain buyers are going to use futures to determine what price they can pay competitively for local cash grain. And so we start with the futures price and we adjust for transportation, hauling, and local supply demand. And that's how you get your local cash price. So if we give you kind of a flow chart example here of how your local price might be calculated, let's start with the Chicago Board of Trade corn futures trading at $3.90 a bushel. We take maybe a 20 cent deduction in basis on local supply and demand. Let's say, for example, we're here in southern Illinois and we expect to be a, a fairly sizable corn crop. Uh, a processor cash price might be $3.70. If we subtract another 15 cents for freight and handling costs, that gets you to an established local elevator bid of $3.55. Your local elevator has to account for supply demand uh, as well as the freight and handling costs that they have incurred by trucks coming in, dumping grain at their location, loading it through their handling system, back out on a truck more than likely or out to rail um, before it gets moved on to wherever it the next destination is. But that's how they calculate uh, the local cash price. So you'll see oftentimes a relationship between the local price and the futures price, and they will oftentimes move in very similar directions. Basis then is that difference between futures price and what is paid locally for grain price. So is it 20 cents under the board is some good uh, jargon that you'll hear occasionally or uh, 35 cents under the board. And so it's the value most grain businesses use to trade grain. So to a merchandiser, the price of grain is irrelevant. Lots of them are going to make buying and selling decisions based upon basis um, because it can be under, over, or equals to the futures price um, based upon a number of different local factors. Now, if we were out in, let's say, southern Wyoming, where there's not near as much row crop, your elevator basis may be you may be trading above the board because there's not as much supply out there. But of course, here in Southern Illinois, there's quite a bit of supply. And so you're more than likely going to trade under the board unless we get an inverted market for us, uh, which is some kind of crop shortage or something like that. Characteristics of basis, again, just like I was mentioning, either higher or lower in relation to futures, uh, depending on what's going on. So, for an example, uh, a processor in central Illinois may be able to meet corn needs paying 20 cents below March futures. That MCH stands for March in gra uh, grain trading abbreviations. A processor in Arkansas may have to pay 20 cents over March futures to attract enough corn to their marketplace to meet the needs. Um, generally, you're going to see the, typically the lowest basis at harvest time, and that's primarily because lots of grain is available and coming to the marketplace probably but it's constantly going to move up and down to attract grain in or out of the marketplace. If the basis strengthens, which means the basis is getting wider or farther away from the futures price, um, you know, especially for us, if, if we go from a basis of 15 cents under the board to 40 cents under the board, your local elevators are telling you it would be a smart idea to store grain because they'll take it, but they're going to buy it at a discount. And the market doesn't need grain either. So, the market is telling you to store grain. 
So it generally represents a change in the marketplace. And if you see the basis weaken, meaning moving closer to futures or even get inverted above the futures price, then your local elevators and the grain market itself is trying to attract grain away from the farm, get it, get it off the farm, into the truck and into the pipeline. So those things can, can be positive or negative in, in relationship to the supply of grain and, and the need for grain movement. So how do you make money off the basis? So if an elevator buys a thousand bushels of cashed corn at 425 and immediately sells the same amount of March corn futures at 455, that locks in a basis spread for them of 30 cents uh, per bushel on that on that thousand bushels corn. It kind of per, gives protection for changes in price time uh, for them. So you can kind of see how that local elevator may try and utilize the bushels that they have coming to create a little bit of profit margin for themselves because occasionally they're not going to be able to do uh, that well. So why basis? A couple different approaches here. Uh, when we look at basis, you know, we could trade in back-to-back -back fashion, what we call the top left-hand side of the screen, back-to-back. -back. So we buy grain and resell in a short period of time. So I could buy a thousand bushels of corn today, turn around tomorrow and sell it for another, for that, sell that same thousand bushels. And whatever the price movement uh, between yesterday and today would be my profit margin. And it would likely be very small if it went up at all. So I'm very, very little risk, uh, also very little profit margin possibility. I could also speculate, which means purchase uh, grain or cash futures in a market and wait in hopes for a favorable price movement before making the offsetting transaction. We'll talk about equal and offsetting transactions later. The problem is, is that's a high level of risk because I may be buying at the high of the market and uh, therefore, I would have, you know, it, it may go down significantly. So I would have to hold on to that contract or that grain for quite a long time before I had the opportunity to sell it at a profitable mark again, or I would have to take a loss on it. So that's what you call speculation. The reason why we really encourage to track basis, and you'll be doing that mathematically here this semester, is we can purchase and sell grain on hedges with offsetting futures transaction and wait for a favorable favorable basis move. The basis is much more predictable seasonally than price. And so you can improve your margins oftentimes without a high level of risk, uh, oftentimes doubling or tripling your back-to-back -back margins. So I watch basis spreads a lot more than I do uh, typical price oftentimes. So what's the basis? So again, like I mentioned, price movement is a lot more risky. You know, if you say I need to, I need to be able to sell my corn for 450 a bushel. Well, we'd all like to sell corn for 450 a bushel right now, but how long would we have to wait in for it to get there? At this point in time, probably quite a while. Um, but if I had the opportunity to sell corn at, uh, let's say the futures was sitting at 350 and my local elevator was just 10 cents under the board, that's a pretty good price opportunity. And so I might be I might be willing to load up the truck and get a thousand bushels to town at 10 cents under the board. If I don't anticipate the grain price going much higher, um, they're trying to attract grain to the market. So generally speaking, like I said, basis is much more predictable than following just raw price. So it's important to, to follow not only the price, but the basis levels as well. Local basis patterns, they're typically very consistently moving and they're somewhat interconnected. So it's meant to drive grain from areas of excess supply to short supply. And we're again, we'll talk basis uh, basically all the, all the way through the semester and how it's gonna affect what goes on with you. If we look at demand and supply, um, so whenever you have demand, it's the quantity of a commodity which buyers will purchase at different prices in a given market at a given time. So if we look at, just for example, uh, price of corn on the uh, y-axis, billion bushels of corn in the marketplace on the x-axis here, and if the price is up around six bushels, uh, or six dollars a bushel, um, we're probably in a short supply of corn. And so people are gonna have to be very competitive to buy it. If, you know, the if the supply of corn gets out around 
8.5 billion bushels uh, in a year's time, that means the price is probably going to come down significantly um, because there's so much there. So we have, because of the oversupply, we have to drop the price to get it sold, which is kind of where we sit right now with a lot of the corn price. So if we look at demand principles versus demand elasticity, here we get to some basic economics terms. Um, you know, it has a lot to, indu uh, to do with diminished marginal utility and aggregate demand versus demand elasticity. A great change in demand in relation to price makes it elastic. A little change in demand in response to price makes it inelastic. We'll talk more examples as we go through, uh, go through this in class and start to practice some of our uh, activities. But wanted to introduce or reintroduce some of those uh, ag economics terms that you maybe learned uh, in Ag Econ class. So changes in demand shift the entire demand curve and you'll hear some of the analysts that will bring in videos and, and radio clips into a classroom. You'll hear them talk about this a lot. Of course, population, the number of consumers entering and leaving the market shifts the demand curve potentially. Income amounts uh, shifts the purchasing power of the customer. Um, so as we enter recessions or times where folks don't have as much money, it shifts their purchasing power. Uh, habits and preferences, you know, whether it's tastes or seasons or circumstances or preferences, uh, shifts potential demand supply preferences. Uh, prices of substitutes or complementary products uh, also can potentially shift the demand curve. As you see individuals that have um, more disposable income, they'll buy more meat, for example and add more meat to their diet. As the population continues to grow, we obviously need to feed them. So that shifts the demand curve. And so there's a number of different things that can move that demand curve one way or the other, and of course then drives the supply. So three key demand distinctions, demand versus consumption. They're two different things. Um, need versus effective demand, and then farm level versus retail level demand. There's a certain amount of grain that's available on the farm, and there's also a different amount of grain available or meat product that's available at the retail counter. So we break things into want, need, and effective demand. Want, what would I have if I had a choice? Need, the must-haves, and then effective demand, what I choose to buy when I can afford it. So that really you know, dictates what the consumer tends to do. All right. So we talk about demand, let's look at supply. And you'll notice it's a bit of an opposite curve here. Uh, the more the product is offered for sale at a higher price, the less at lower prices. So again, if we are sitting at $3 bushel corn on the Y axis here, you know, farmers oftentimes tend to react to that and plant more of a different crop, which will then maybe only result in the supply of 6 billion bushels. Well, if you do that for a couple of years, you're probably going to shorten your supply in the market chain. And therefore the price is probably going to rally until it starts to go up. As we approach that $5, million, $5 per bushel mark, producers are inclined then, they're incentivized to produce more corn. And so you see the supply start to match that and get up to that eight and a half billion bushels supply. So very, very close demand supply relationship. So three factors affect the extent to which producers increase supply. Willingness to sell at an, at an existing supply from storage, increased use of variable inputs, and shifting resources between alternative uses. So you can choose to plant corn, you can choose to plant soybeans. The market forces are gonna oftentimes move you one direction or the other. And if neither one of those is any good, you're potentially gonna look at something completely different to plant. So, Likewise, relationships exist, and we call that elasticity that occurs with supply. Things that shift the supply curve is technology, innovation, regulation, input, and occasionally government programs uh, in terms of what we do with the demand supply relationship and what we choose to put in the ground or what we choose to, uh, choose to supply in the animal market. So it's always an enigmatic supply demand balance. Supply on one side, demand on the other, and they almost never balance exactly out. Uh, you would like for them to, 
but it rarely balances from one side of the slide here to the other. So because demand and supply is rarely equilibrium, it leads to what we call price discovery, which is really what drives the marketplace. Uh, so we have to evaluate that relationship and determine a general price for a commodity, okay? And then we determine that relative and general market levels, grade differences, you know, the high value corn, um, best quality corn versus not so good quality corn. And then what buyer and seller services can be provided. So there's always a conflict between individual farmers and farmer and uh, farmers that cause economic challenges. Uh, a large number of buyers and sellers, nobody sufficiently large enough to influence the price. Uh, the farmer has to has to be a price taker. Uh, both buyers and sellers have not knowledge in the marketplace. So they're gonna util utilize that to maximize profit. There's no collusion or operating restrictions amongst the buyer or seller to limit supply. Um, the product for the most part in, is pretty homogeneous. You know, corn is basically corn. Soybeans are basically soybeans. Milk is for the most part milk. Uh, so that creates a lot of, a lot of competition. And then factors of production that are welcome to enter and leave as they wish, you know, like cattle. So what about limiting supply to raise demand and price? And what about price ceilings and floors? Always something that comes up when we talk about demand supply basics. So essentially on the left side of the slide, I'm talking about quotas. Um, those are being a little bit used in the corn market or in the milk market right now is quotas. So you can only produce up to a certain amount and then you'll have to sell your milk at a, at a discounted price. That's never been tried in the United States in the grain market. So what do you think would happen if you were told you're only allowed to sell 170 bushels per acre? Anything above that is going to be penalized or we just simply won't take it. That creates a lot of consternation be, you know, with our free market economy that we have in, U in the U.S. And then what about price ceilings and floors? You know, what would you think of, hey, we would put a price floor on corn of $3.50 a bushel, but in response to that, it's never gonna go higher than $4.50 a bushel. What would you think about that? Always things that we talk about with grain marketing and livestock marketing products. So the market doesn't really care about the cost of production. It doesn't really care about that. Their only concern is the price necessary to balance available supply with effective demand, which just creates a lot of uh, trouble occasionally um, to create profitability. So that's going to wrap up. We'll talk a lot more about this through the semester and then how all of these baseline concepts that we're talking about here, how they affect the futures price movement, which kind of sets the tone for um, all of the livestock and grain products that we'll be merchandising. Thanks for tuning in to segment two of our video in unit one.